Yeah. Crazy times we're living through, but getting through it. You're on, Ken. Great. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in a couple minutes. Just uh, wait, for, get a little more of a quorum. Uh, but welcome uh, to the Anti-Retrovirals Prevention uh, uh, Working Group. For those who are just joining, uh, this is the Antiretrovirals for Prevention Working Group. Uh, we'll get started in another minute or so. I think we will get started. Um, on behalf of my uh, co-chair, uh, Patrick Sullivan, uh, uh, this is Ken Mayer. I'd like to welcome you to the Antiretrovirals for Prevention uh, Working Group. Uh, this is an inter-CFAR working group. Uh, we meet every other month. I hope all of you who are on the call today are getting the regular announcements. But if not, if you want to get in touch with my colleague, Alberto Tabani at the Harvard Center for AIDS Research, uh, uh, we will be sending out notifications of these uh, bi-monthly calls. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have with us uh, Dr. Raphael Landovitz. Uh, Raphael Landovitz um, uh, is uh, really a world-recognized um, expert on the use of antiretrovirals for prevention, uh, the topic that he'll be covering today. Uh, Dr. Landovitz uh, did his undergraduate work at Princeton, uh, attended Harvard Medical School, was um, uh, um, a, a resident um, and a chief resident and infectious disease fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital and then uh, the um, fellowship in the joint program with Massachusetts General Hospital. And then unfortunately he left Boston uh, and but has gone on to bigger and better things. He uh, uh, directed um, a Harvard program on Vietnam um, and then uh, moved on to the West Coast. Uh, he is a professor of medicine at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles and at UCLA. He also co-directs uh, uh, several centers there, the CHIP Center and the CARE Center, uh, and is uh, one of the, the leaders of their uh, clinical trial unit and uh, their um, um, Center for AIDS Research. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have uh, very few with us today to talk about um, uh, some of the key findings from the study that he led um, um, evaluating injectable capotegravir for HIV prevention, and perhaps also share some insights from the parallel study, HP10084, uh, that are relevant as well. Um, so um, our system is such that um, we've disabled um, uh, direct conversation, but you, um, through the chat function, you can uh, put um, questions for the panelists, and my colleague uh, Patrick Sullivan will be moderating them with uh, Rafi at the end of his talk. So Rafi, please take it away, and again, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thanks, Ken, and thanks, Patrick, for inviting me. Um, it's really nice to see so many friends on the, on the call today, um, including some of our co-investigators from 083. Um, Ken is being very, very kind um, in his um, uh, introduction, and I, I thank him for that. Um, uh, it's, uh, it was, I'm very fond of my years in Boston, and Ken's also leaving out that I briefly um, had the great privilege of working at Fenway um, for about a year and a half um, before I had left Boston. So that was really fun. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, long acting injectable cabotegravir 
um, including some recent updates that we've presented um, at CROI this year about the pharmacokinetics and resistance complications of the breakthrough infections on cabotegravir that I think are particularly important to how we think about this product as it um, approaches regulatory approvals um, and contextualize that in, in the context of the exciting superiority result we had during its efficacy study. So these are my disclosures. This is what I'm gonna talk about today, a little background on PrEP that I think is gonna be very familiar to everyone on this call, so I'll zip through it. A little bit about the 083 study design and our statistical methods, um, then our results really briefly, and then some additional up updates. Um, and then what I think is um, some of the unanswered questions and, and sort of the pathway forward. So those of you who know me um, uh, and have heard me speak before will be very familiar and I hope not bored by this slide. It's one of my favorites. The concept here is I know that when you put up tables of efficacy results um, on uh, for studies, everyone immediately starts checking their email um, and their social media accounts. So this is my attempt to make this digestible. The concept here is, you know, I grew up in the Northeast and as Ken said, spent a lot of time in Boston, you know, in the holiday times um, at synagogues and churches and mosques, um, when they do um, fundraising drives, there's often a thermometer picture or graphic outside of the place of worship and they fill it up as, as they go through their fundraising. And sort of that's the concept here um, is the population that was studied, the, the sex at birth is in the, the outline of the graphic and the how full up the graphic is, is the point estimate of the efficacy. And what you can see here uh, among the tenofovir based PrEP studies, most of them daily, we'll get to that in a second, compared to placebo, um, um, is a wide variety of point estimates of efficacy um, that led to an enormous amount of confusion and consternation among both providers and potential consumers of PrEP that, that sort of set up the stage um, for um, the evolving PrEP research agenda. And of course, we understand now um, that um, these disparate results were largely based on different use of the study product and different levels of forgiveness for rectal versus vaginal exposures leading to this wide um, uh, uh, set of, of disparate results. Of course, the exceptions to that rule are in the, the last two studies on this slide, the PROUD and the Ipergay study. The PROUD study wasn't placebo controlled. It was an immediate versus deferred strategy, sort of a pragmatic approach. Um, that showed 86% efficacy for daily oral TDF FTC immediately versus delayed. Um, and the Iperday study, I apologize for what looks like a jailed mime figure um, in that graphic. The idea was to denote that it was done in France and Quebec. So that's why the little beret and the stripes to indicate that it was um, a pericoidal or on-demand strategy rather than a, da a daily study, which was the rest of, of, of these um, studies. Um, of course, you know, um, Ken loves to term um, this this next sort of set of studies um, as PrEP 2.0, and I think that's very appropriate. Um, it's the sort of the next generation of PrEP agents that acknowledged that um, the available agents were not having the population level effect um, across all populations. And what I mean by population level effects, reductions in HIV incidence that have been dramatically shown um, um, among populations in locations like Sydney, New York, London, and San Francisco. Um, but, um, you know, so our most vulnerable populations not seeing those population level benefits and, and us needing additional agents and expanding choices um, uh, of different options, making an analogy to the contraception field um, where more choices are um, more likely to find something that's acceptable to a given person at that point in their sexual life cycle. Um, of course, um, uh, the MTN's ASPIRE trial and IPM's Depivirine ring trial showing about 30% efficacy compared to placebo um, uh, for this Depivirine ring. Depivirine, of course, being a non-nucleoside refers to transcriptase inhibitor um, that is uh, not available as an oral preparation. And this agent now has European Medicines Association regulatory approvals and is before the US FDA and really has brought to the fore the discussion of this question of could something that has lower um, effectiveness seen in randomized trials actually have a tremendous population level benefit because it's more acceptable than, than um, uh, uh, agents that might appear to be more effective in randomized trials. 
Um, and then uh, a study uh, uh, that was um, comparing uh, FTAF to FTDF that was run by Gilead and, and showed non-inferiority of FTAF compared to TDF for um, in gay men and transgender women um, and led to US regulatory approvals for FTAF for all routes of exposure except for vaginal um, exposures um, after a non-inferiority result in this trial. And, and that, that trial was published by, by Ken and, and, the, and the Discover team um, in, in Lancet HIV earlier last year, a tremendously exciting result. But that was sort of PrEP 2.0. And I guess sort of, you know, are we heading towards PrEP 3.0? And the context of this conversation is going to be about cabotegravir, which I like to call the artist formerly known as GSK1265744, um, in case you've been following its development. It's a chemical congener of dolutegravir. Um, uh, you can see on the bottom, for those of you who like organic chemistry, that they're structurally very similar, but cabotegravir has a couple of unique properties in that um, it's, it's more uniquely suited to be developed for a long-acting um, nano suspension for long-acting injection. Um, and the reason for that um, is you can crystallize the pure drug substance and then suspend it in polyethylene glycol um, and inject it into a muscle where it serves as um, a depot um, that slowly um, uh, seeps into blood plasma giving prolonged exposure. And I think most people on this call are aware that long acting cabotegravir with a long acting version of real pibrine now has regulatory approvals in the US, Canada and Europe um, for maintenance of virologic suppression once someone living with HIV is already virologically suppressed and doesn't have previous failure or anticipated resistant either of those agents. But we're gonna be talking about cabotegravir um, as a single agent, um, as, a, as a PrEP agent. So HPTN 083, just to be brief, for those who aren't um, familiar with it, was designed in the context and background of the studies that I mentioned. Um, it was a phase 2B3 randomized double blind, double dummy study done at 43 sites in seven countries globally. It enrolled cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men ages 18 and up. Uh, it increased risk for um, HIV acquisition. And we can talk about what the criteria were. If people are interested, it's, it was sort of a, an interesting approach. Generally healthy, no hep B or hep C and no contraindications to gluteal injections. Because of these disparate benefits, um, that were not realized by our most vulnerable um, populations still acquiring HIV, we specifically tried to enroll at least half of the overall population um, under the age of 30. So young people, um, at least 10% of the population overall trans identified, and at least half of the US enrollment self-identifying as black or African-American and the primary endpoint safety and efficacy are shown here. These were the sites that did the study. There were 27 sites in the US. There were five sites in Peru, two in Argentina, four in Brazil, one in South Africa, three in Thailand, and one in Vietnam. You can see, therefore, the global scope of the study. And this was the study design. It is a tiny bit complicated. So with your permission, I'm gonna take just a second to go over it. People who were eligible were randomized either to the orange arm or the blue arm on this slide. And I'm gonna use that convention throughout the presentation. Um, the orange arm is the cabotegravir arm. The blue arm is the TDF-FTC arm. And if you look at the top half of the slide, you know, there's a three-step structure. So everybody um, in the first part of the study who was eligible um, would, would took um, two tablets orally every day for five weeks. One was active, one was placebo. No one got both active agents and no one got both placebo agents. Um, in that, in the cab um, arm of the oral lead-in, people got active cab tablets and a Truvada placebo for five weeks. The reason for this, of course, was to make sure that there was no hypersensitivity or acute adverse events that you would want to, for lack of a better word, sieve out before you provided a long act acting injectable version of the drug that once administered, you couldn't remove. On the bottom half of the slide, um, in that oral lead-in phase, people took a cab placebo tablet and were begun on daily oral Truvada that would continue throughout the lifespan of the study. Um, if people had acceptable safety and tolerability in that five week oral lead in period, and we did check in with people twice during that period for lab assessments, HIV testing and sort of tolerability assessments, 
They then moved on to the primary comparison of interest, which we called step two, and that was the injectable oral comparison. So again, top half of the slide, people in the orange cabotegravir arm then got injections of cabotegravir, a three milliliter single injection in the gluteal muscle um, every eight weeks after the first two separated by just a month. And their placebo Truvada um, continued throughout um, this portion of the study. And in the bottom half of the slide for the injectable phase, they now got a sham or placebo injection and it was a 20% intralipid solution that was visually and viscosity wise indistinguishable from the cabotegravir preparation and actually, just for people who are sort of following this literature, was the same placebo that was used in um, the phase three efficacy studies for the injectable paliperidone studies. Um, so that was where that idea came from. Um, and they continued um, daily oral TDF, FTC, that was active throughout. And the cabotegravir sham injections, the intralipid injections, were given on that same injection schedule as was the active cabotegravir in the orange arm. Anyone who um, stopped the injections early jumped to step three of the study, and that was just basically open label Truvada um, for a year. And the idea of that was to protect against HIV acquisition during the pharmacokinetic tail. And as, um, uh, as I know a lot of you um, are very familiar with, there was a lot of concern going into the use of these um, injectable agents about the pharmacokinetic tail, this period during prolonged pharmacokinetic um, concentration decline after the last injection, if people stop the injectable product or relate for it, which might represent a period of vulnerability, um, particularly to seroconversion with virus that might then be resistant to cabotegravir and potentially other integrase inhibitors, which is something that I think is going to be a concern for all these long acting agents. So very briefly, in case we have any methods um, uh, folks on the call today, I just want to reference our statistical design. It was designed as a non-inferiority study and our pre-specified non-inferiority margin was 1.23. And I mentioned that because that's different than the non-inferiority used in the DISCOVER trial, which was 1.62. And if people are interested, we could have a conversation about why those differences. So that's a 23% relative non-inferiority margin that was pre-specified. We did have an alternative hypothesis um, of a hazard ratio of 0 0.75 between the arms. That means we assumed or we, um, we presaged that um, cabotegravir would be at least 25% better than Truvada, probably because of its um, anticipated better coverage of sex acts because of the absence of a need for a daily um, patient-directed intervention. We were targeting a background HIV incidence in the population of about 4.5 per 100 person years. That's really important because as people who've thought about these prevention studies know quite well, once you have an active comparator study, you don't obviously have a pure placebo arm, so you never know for sure what the background incidence rate in your population is, and therefore calculation um, of an absolute risk reduction afforded by the agent that you're testing is always going to be based on um, estimations of what the counterfactual um, um, background incidence was in your population. Otherwise, you just have a relative hazard ratio or incidence rate ratio between your active arms. And so for this, our study size calculation, we also um, estimated or guesstimated that the adherence to Truvada in our Truvada arm based on detectable plasma tenofovir concentrations would be about 57%. It was an endpoint driven study with pre-specified um, interim analyses at a quarter, half and three quarters um, of our endpoints accrued. And I will say that we had an enormous amount of trepidation when we designed this study because 172 events, and by events, we're meaning zero conversions in this case, that was more zero conversion events that have been seen in all of the efficacy studies of PrEP combined to date at that point. So that's a lot of events that you would need to fully power this study. Lucky for us, the, at our first pre-specified analysis when 25% of the endpoints had been accrued, our DSMB said stop um, and asked that we unblind the study. Um, and that was the first tranche of data that we presented at AIDS 2020 last summer. So first, let me talk about that analysis. So at the time the DSMB stopped us, we had 4,570 participants randomized. The, um, the, the, the sample size at that point had been um, uh, aimed for 5,000 participants. So we were um, just under 500 participants short of completing the final enrollment goal when the DSMB stopped us. You can see 
the number of people randomized to each arm. We did for the ITT analysis exclude four people um, who um, actually had, did not meet the inclusion exclusion criteria and that had been pre-specified. Um, and, and then for the primary efficacy cohort, we did actually exclude an additional 71 people who had no follow-up visits um, at which the HIV status could be determined. You can see our retention rates um, on this slide also, which was about 75% by two years, which really reflects the highly mobile um, and chaotic lives of these um, risky um, or increased risk individuals that we um, enrolled in this, um, in this cohort. So this was our study population. I'm just gonna be really brief here, again, using um, the convention of cabin orange and TDF FTC in blue to, to tell you about the metrics. Uh, we had pre-specified, if you remember that 10% study population at least um, was um, uh, designed to be self-identified as trans and we actually got 12.4%. So we exceeded that, we were really excited. We had said that um, half of the study population would be under the age of 30 and we were two thirds under the age of 30. A lot of people ask me what proportion of the OE3 participants were NIH defined adolescents, which of course is 13 to 24. And we didn't enroll 13 to 17, so I can only tell you 18 to 24, and that was 40% of our population. It's not on this slide, but you can just hold that, that fact. And then we had pre-specified that 50% of our US enrollment would be Black or African American, and we just made um, that metric. So this, these were the primary results that we presented at AIDS 2020. Um, overall, we found a pooled HIV incidence of 0.81 per 100 person years, and that was with a median 1.4 years of per participant follow-up. And I think people are very familiar with these results in the lower left graphic on this slide. We had 13 incident infections um, in the CAB arm and 39 incident infections in the TDF FTC arm with incidence rates of 0.41 and 1.22 per 100 person years respectively. And on the right side of the slide, that gave us a hazard ratio of 0.34 with confidence intervals that not only excluded our non-inferiority bound of 1.23, which is that solid black line, the superiority bound of 1.0, which is that dotted black line, but also all our, our, our alternative hypothesis of 0.75, which is that dotted blue line. Um, I do wanna just take a moment to say that some people were confused because when the results first came out by press release, it, people said a non-inferiority result. And then finally, when we presented it at age 2020, we reported a superiority result which you can see here, um, and people were confused. What happened? What did the data change? The data didn't change. Um, what changed was it turns out that when you stop at the first interim stopping boundary with only 25% of the events in a trial like this, it's such a rare event that calculating the 95% confidence intervals was non-traditional. And we actually had to um, consult with um, sort of the global expert on these non-inferiority trial designs, a guy named Scott Emerson, um, who sort of written the seminal papers on how one does this to advise everyone on how to calcul calculate these 95% confidence bounds to, um, to fully lay plain um, what they were. So that was why we didn't wanna declare superiority if we were still having debates about how to calculate the non-inferiority bounds um, or the 95% confidence interval bounds um, at that point. So that was what that was about. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve um, for that result. You can see with a highly statistically significant p-value of 0.005. Um, people have asked um, uh, you know, about the subpopulations that we had pre-specified, you know, if that result held true for those populations. Um, the study wasn't powered for these um, sub-analyses. These were pre-specified, but it wasn't powered on that. And you can see overall the, um, the result was in the same direction and with ballpark the same magnitude. Um, but again, you'll see some of those values do cross one and please remember it wasn't powered to answer these questions. Um, a lot of attention um, was given to this graphic that I presented at the AIDS 2020 conference. And I do wanna go through it um, in a little bit of detail because um, this, these were conceptual buckets that I put the 13, um, incident HIV infections in the cabotegravir arm, and they're also included on this slide, are the two prevalent infections in the cab arm. And what I mean by that is it turns out on sensitive retrospective testing that these people actually were infected and in the eclipse or window period 
um, when they began PrEP. So they actually were living with HIV before they ever got any PrEP agents. So they're not counted among the incident infections, but they do sort of give us interesting information about what can happen with cabotegravir as PrEP when you initiate it during that eclipse or window period. So these A cases, A1 and A2, these are the prevalent or baseline cases. They had evidence of infection on sensitive back testing done retrospectively before they ever got any study product. The B cases are ones that in my mind, I could explain fairly easily um, because the, the infection was identified and um, uh, uh, long after the last administration of any cabotegravir. We'll come back to B1 and B4 a little bit later because these are people um, where they were actually given TDF FTC during the tail phase um, and they acquired HIV anyway. What you see here um, is essentially a, a version of the medication possession ratio. So they had drug if it was a solid colored line and they were late for um, administration of drug if it's a hatched line. So I hope that's helpful. The green virus emojis um, represent um, uh, when uh, the, the HIV infection was identified at the central laboratory. Um, so the C cases represent infection that was detected during the oral lead-in period. Um, and we'll come back to that because um, uh, I think that's important. And then these five cases were really, really provocative and I think caused a lot of speculation about what was going on because as far as we could tell when we first presented these data, um, these were infections, breakthroughs, that happened despite on-time cabotegravir injections. So sort of prep failures without a good explanation when we first presented it. And when we first presented it, we didn't have pharmacokinetics and resistance. So this was sort of a, a frustrating situation for a lot of people. These were the TDF FTC cases. Again, 39 incident cases. And at the bottom, 40, 41, and 42 are prevalent cases. So again, eclipse or window period cases. Um, uh, that the infection was detected on the central laboratory before administration of any study product. So just coming back to us for a second to this question of how well did people take the TDF FTC in this study, I'm gonna first ask you to look over on the right side of the slide to that black and white box that says plasma tenofovir. Remember the study design was built on this notion of 57% of the, the TDF FTC participants um, would take Truvada sufficiently well to have detectable plasma tenofovir concentrations. So in, in a, the adherence cohort, which was a randomly selected subset of about 400 people um, in the Truvada arm in our study, we actually found 87% had detectable TDF FTC, con well, tenofovir plasma concentrations. Um, 75% of them had tenofovir plasma concentrations greater than 40, which is suggestive of you know, more like daily dosing. And then the colored bars on this slide is this Pete Anderson, um, Jose Castillo Mancia sort of derived rubric that we've um, sort of now been custom to um, looking at using intraerythrocytic intra tenofovir diphosphate in dried blood spots. And on the top in the green and white, um, are the proportions with four or more doses per week that we would anticipate um, ha uh, having high level, high concentrations sufficient to provide high levels of rectal protection. And the overall um, estimate is on the left. And then by week, you can see it sort of tailing off a little bit over, over the course of the study. So people were actually more adherent to the TDF FTC than we um, predicated the study design upon. And again, you know, questions have come up about whether this was generalizable across regions and populations. You can see it's slightly lower, at least based on the tenofovir diphosphate um, concentrations in Latin America. It was lower among Black or African Americans in the US. It was about the same in the younger um, participants, and it was lower um, in the, the transgender individuals throughout the study compared to the cisgender MSM. So just a brief comment on safety. I think everyone's worried about injection site reactions. You can see on the left side of the slide that 81% had some injection site reaction. The grading is by color. Um, mild was green, moderate was yellow. The more severe of grade three was red, which was rare. And you can see um, throughout um, the injections that are um, laid out on the right side of the slide that this overall decreased over time. It, um, the hatched bars are um, the sham injection proportions. Um, what was interesting is for the red or severe ones, um, there was actually a 75-fold increase 
um, odds of discontinuation of injectable study product if you had a severe injection site reaction. So this isn't going to be for everyone. And I think that's important that some people are going to get these injection site reactions and render this not a tolerable or acceptable mode of, of prevention. Um, just very briefly, in terms of other adverse events, not surprisingly, there were more creatinine, decreases in creatinine clearance in the TDF-FTC arm. Oddly, there was more nasopharyngitis in the CAB arm. I'm not sure what to do with that. Um, there was more increased glucose um, in the cab arm that wasn't seen in the treatment studies or other studies. So that's being looked into a little bit more. And there was more pyrexia um, in, or fever in the cab arm and that was associated with injection site reaction. So that's probably the etiology of that. Some people have said, wow, that's impressive. You had low incidence in both arms of the study. How do you know that means? Um, that doesn't mean that people um, just stop being at risk. They increase their condom use. Um, and I think this answers that question pretty definitively. If you look at the bacterial STI incidence rate um, overall and between the arms of the population, I mean, 16.5 um, per 100 person years incidence syphilis and rectal, gonorrhea, and chlamydia combined over 27 per 100 person years. So it's clear that there was condomless um, intercourse going on um, uh, throughout the study, I think pretty definitively. And for those of you who are um, fans of STIs, um, yes, every one of those um, syphilis diagnoses was centrally adjudicated. Um, uh, we did centrally adjudicate every RPR that was done in the entire study. And those of you who were part of the study team know how burdensome that was, but um, I think it was well worth um, the effort because of the rigor of these results. Um, a lot of people have also been interested in weight gain because I think, um, I, as people know, in the treatment literature, there's really a lot of interest um, in weight gain from integrase inhibitors and weight gain from TAF um, versus weight loss from TDF and how do those balance out and the HIV inflammatory milieu. So this study was a particularly um, nice um, laboratory to look um, at that metric because obviously these are not people who are living with HIV and there isn't a third agent complicating these regimens. And what you can see um, in these weight changes over time is overall there was a significant difference in weight change, 1.3 um, uh, kilograms per year in the cab arm compared to 0.3, so a difference of about a kilogram between the two arms. But it's really driven by what happens in the first year. In the first year, you get a kilogram and a half of weight gain in the cabotegravir arm and half a kilo of weight loss in the FTDF arm. And then after that, it's really all the same, one kilo per year. So that's it's kind of interesting. There seems to be some weight suppressive effect um, from the FTDF in that first year. And then after that, everything's equal. And that's sort of what's falling out of some of these other studies as well is that FTDF seems to have a weight suppressive effect and there may or may not be an additional contribution by CAB or um, FTAF. So th that was where we were. And then, you know, as we were doing this central laboratory testing, we observed something unexpected. And in retrospect, maybe it shouldn't have been so unexpected because if you look at the partner's prep data and other data sets about what happens in the extremely rare cases where people do acquire HIV in the setting of FTDF use, um, and there's intermittent use, um, there are delays in viremia and antigen and antibody production. But what we didn't expect was really profound suppression um, and delays in these, um, these testing uh, reactivity rates and timings um, that we saw in the cab arm. So remember, this was our primary result. Um, and just to tell you a little bit more, about the pre-specified HIV testing that we did at the sites. On the left side of the site, what the, the sites were doing is at every visit throughout this study, every participant got a rapid point of care antibody test and then a laboratory or instrument-based um, fourth or fifth generation antigen antibody test. Um, additionally, every participant who enrolled in the study had a negative HIV RNA within 14 days of entry into the study. What we did on stored specimens retrospectively, this was not done in real time. Um, this was done at the HPTN Laboratory Center at Johns Hopkins um, at, at, after the study was unblinded, um, was an architect fourth generation antigen antibody test, um, a genius confirmatory discriminatory test, an aptima qualitative RNA test, which 
has roughly um, a lower limit of quantitation of about 30 copies per milliliter. And we back tested from that first point of site based identification until the aptum was, was negative once. And it turns out that um, that was sort of um, not the best thing to do. And um, what we sort of figured out is because CAB is so potent as an antiviral, um, you need to not stop when you find one negative qualitative RNA test. And so as we figured this out, what we started doing was we back tested with the qualitative aptima all the way back to enrollment for these cabotegravir zero conversions. We did a slightly different strategy in the TDF FTC participants that I can tell you about if you're curious. Um, and we also did quantitative RNA testing to help identify these cases. And when we did that, I'm gonna ask you here, um, I have D2 and D5 boxed in red because I have some animation I'm gonna ask you to follow with me. Watch the green virus emojis as we sort of extended the back testing what happened is the timing of the first detection of these infections moved. And with D5 in particular, what you can see is now it's moved all the way back to detect the detection of virus at enrollment, which meant it's not a D case at all. It's really a three. And when we did this additional testing, we actually came across another case that it turns out was baseline window period or eclipse, and that we called A4. So this is how we ended up with the result that we presented at CROI this year, which is 12 incident infections and four baseline or prevalent infections in the cabotegravir arm. Um, and so that changed um, our estimate of the incidence. Um, and this is post hoc. I want to be very clear about this. This was not a pre-specified analysis to 12 infections, a slightly adjusted incidence rate in the cab arm and a slightly ad adjusted hazard ratio. It doesn't change the interpretation or the magnitude of the effect really very much at all. Um, but the devil does end up in the details. And because these are sort of unicorn situations, it gives us an opportunity to sort of think about and interrogate each of these sort of buckets a little bit more carefully. And so the A cases, um, which are the prevalent or baseline cases, what did we learn from these cases? Well, we learn if you actually miss um, diagnosing HIV infection in that window or eclipse period, um, and uh, you you start up cabotegravir as prep. Um, it can make cabotegravir can make it extremely challenging to find that infection later. The viral load can be lower, and it can even be undetectable with cabotegravir essentially monotherapy. The aptima testing or quantitative RNA testing were the best test to detect infection the earliest. The point of care rapid and the fourth or fifth generation laboratory tests were delayed in turning reactive and they would flicker and they would turn positive and then negative and then positive causing a tremendous amount of confusion at the sites. And if you don't diagnose the HIV infection with one of these nucleic acid based tests before you start cabotegravir prep, it can lead to not only continued administration of oral cab if you're using the oral lead in, but it can even make you progress to the cabotegravir injections because you haven't detected the infection you think somebody is um, actually HIV uninfected. And if you actually miss that and the virus escapes cabotegravir monotherapy while the cabotegravir concentrations are high, and this is really important, it, you can end up with cab resistance. We had one case like that. But when the virus escaped during the tail, that is that pharmacokinetic decline at, after last injection, it didn't have cab resistance. And we had one case of that. And I'm not going to go through these in detail. We can come back to it if people ask questions. But these are the plots of the four A cases, the orange dots are the cabotegravir concentrations. The dotted lines are the non-human primate um, benchmarks of um, 1x, 4x, and 8x PAIC90. And you can see what's happening with the viral loads on above each plot, that they can be really suppressed. And what's sort of provocative here are the delays in testing between the central laboratory and the site-based testing, which can range from four weeks all the way up to 10.3 weeks. This one is A1 is particularly interesting because this is a K65R M184V with some non-nuke transmitted mutations. So this person was living with HIV before they ever got PrEP, but if they had actually been exposed to this virus while on Truvada, they probably would have failed it. 
they had failed. I mean, they were they were living with HIV before they ever got any PrEP. So it's moot, but it's sort of interesting because we talk about this being a very rare beast and we don't see it very often. Um, uh, this particular person, A2, is illustrative of what I was talking about. We know there was wild type virus very early on. Um, and then when they broke through after an injection with these high cab concentrations, they had cab resistance. And for those of you who are into the virology that you can see here, the genotypic mutations um, that were found um, at the viremic breakthroughs. Um, uh, A3 and A4 um, are some examples of this breakthrough during um, the, the tail phase decline and there was not integrase resistance um, uh, during these, these, uh, these uh, that those breakthroughs. What did we learn from the B cases? And these are the ones, if you remember, with no recent cab exposure. Well, what we learned is something that we sort of knew intuitively. If you don't take cabotegravir, it doesn't prevent HIV infection. We had three participants in this group who acquired HIV during this pharmacokinetic tail that we've all been hand wringing around so much. And while this is reassuring, the fact that we didn't see resistance to cab or other integrase inhibitors does not rule out that can happen. Three swallows don't make a summer, um, but I do think it is reassuring because we've certainly been worrying about this for a long time. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is two cases that I mentioned when I first showed you those diagrams where we did give people open label Truvada to cover the tail, they didn't take it and that likely contributed um, to the HIV acquisition. So it, it sort of reminds us that there are people who are gonna do well on an, inter, uh, an injectable PrEP um, who are still gonna be challenged by taking an oral medication and covering the tail with an oral medication isn't gonna be the answer for everyone. So again, these are the five plots of these and I'm gonna show you really quickly um, the details here um, uh, where you can see um, that there are these folks who acquired HIV during the pharmacokinetic tail, that's B1, B3, and B4. Um, you can see that I've circled the pharmacokinetic tail in red. We don't know exactly when during that pharmacokinetic tail that the exposure happened, but none of these three participants um, had integrase or cabotegravir resistant virus um, when, when the virus was detected. So again, reassuring, but not definitive. So um, what else did we learn? So in the oral lead-in people, this is really important. Remember the whole point of the oral lead-in was to sieve out um, uh, the, uh, adverse events. And, and it didn't seem like we sieved out anything. So what did we learn? If you don't take oral cab, it doesn't prevent HIV infection. We don't know how forgiving CAB is to missed doses. Remember, um, Pete Anderson did some really elegant pharmacology and some PKPD modeling from the IPREC study to give us that information um, about um, FTDF. We don't have that information yet for CAB. There's likely a time to onset of protection with oral CAB that we don't know what it is yet. And if CAB delays this incident HIV infection by delaying testing reactivity, inadvertently, you can progress from the oral to the injectable phase. And then you're sort of in this situation of you've given essentially cab monotherapy to someone who's living with HIV. And what we saw was the same thing we saw with those A cases, that if you um, actually do that, and then the virus escapes at high cab concentrations afforded by these injections, you can get cab or other integrase resistance. And these are the three cases and what's interesting, I'm going to show you C2 at the bottom left first. You can see the orange dots. This person never took any cabotegravir as far as we can tell. These are discrete time points, so it is possible they took some between these time points. We'll never know for sure, but basically they disappeared after their oral lead and they never got an injection. When they showed up some 35 weeks later, they were living with HIV, but it turns out that they had actually acquired that infection at the very end um, of their oral lead-in period. Um, the C1 and C3 are particularly illustrative cases because although they, they acquired the infection during the oral lead-in period, the green vertical lines represent cabotegravir injections. So it wasn't detected on the site-based testing. They went on to get these cabotegravir injections and they had these smoldering levels of low-level viremia um, that ultimately went on to escape to about an order of magnitude or more higher and when they did that, when it was finally detected at the site, 
there was cabotegravir and other, whoops, sorry, integrase, I'm ahead of myself here, resistant virus. And again, for those of you who are into the virology, um, you can see what those resistance mutations were. And if you remember from the A cases, what we saw, these are Q148R, all of them with or without accessory mutations. And the accessory mutations in each case seem to be different. We've got an E138A, we've got a G140GS, an E138EK, um, and we had an E138K um, um, in the A case um, as well as the breakthrough with a Q148. Um, so again, um, when you have smoldering viremia, we don't know, we've not been able to genotype with sensitive testing yet that smoldering viremia to know if there's integrase resistance before it breaks through those high levels of resist of a viremia at which we're able to detect the resistance. Then, so let's get to the D cases, because I think these were the most provocative when we first talked about them. These are sort of the unicorn prep failures, right? They, these are the people who got HIV despite on-time cabotegravir injections that we really need to understand in more detail. And I, I'm, I hate to disappoint, but we learned that, you know, there's certainly these delays in the HIV testing. We see that consistently. In these four cases, the cab levels in the plasma were as expected. So there wasn't some low plasma levels that explain these easily. Um, and that's really important. The HIV again smoldered at low level viremias when it first failed. Um, and then when it broke through, escaped this cabotegravir monotherapy, it can lead to cabotegravir and other integrase resistance. And we saw that in two of the four cases. Um, we don't know yet if that resistance can be avoided by navigating people to fully suppressive ART earlier at that low level of smoldering viremia. And let me quickly show you these cases. And you know, I'm gonna show you them each individually because I think they are, they're worth looking at, right? So this one, is someone who, who's doing well, they took their oral drug, you can see the orange dots early on, and then they start getting their injections and they're on time and the levels are pretty good. It sort of only dips below 8X PAIC90 briefly at two occasions, once after the first injection, once um, a little bit later. Um, and then what you see is it breaks through with this low level viremia about week 55. And actually it's kind of weird, the virus is actually below 40, but detectable when the site testing actually flips and they find it at the site. Luckily, this person is navigated extremely quickly to fully suppressive ART, but before we can get a genotype. So I don't know um, if this person had low level integrase resistance, but the 16 week delay um, uh, did you know, give you 16 weeks of exposure and cab monotherapy, and they did suppress on a boosted PI and a retroviral regimen. The second case is a little provocative because this was a really difficult case to diagnose. You can see the levels really didn't dip much at all. Um, the, the central laboratory testing finds the infection about 27 weeks on study. The site finds the first evidence of infection about 42 weeks on study, but the participant doesn't actually believe that their HIV testing is real. And actually in that shaded period goes on four weeks of post-exposure prophylaxis with a boosted PI-based regimen because they don't believe that they're living with HIV, which may have further complicated the diagnosis. Um, finally, as the cabotegravir finally washes out of the system, you get detectable levels of viremia, although they're low and the participant does finally go on a fully suppressive ART regimen. Unfortunately, site-based genotyping for the integrase failed at that point. So we don't have evidence of integrase resistance. That was a 14 week detection. D3 was a similar situation, except um, uh, in, in this case, um, uh, you know, it's sort of interesting. We actually um, are able to find K103N virus because of the high levels of viremia at the first detection. So there's non-nuke resistance that's transmitted, but no integrase resistance. And then it, when the site actually finds it, there is integrase resistance. It's R263K, which is different. Then the others, which interestingly on phenotyping didn't confer resistance to CAB nor any of the other integrase inhibitors makes you wonder what it would have evolved if that had kept going. But luckily they started fully suppressive ART before any further resistance um, evolved. Um, and then this last one is a cautionary tale. And I say it's cautionary because it's a reminder of what I think we really need to do, which is these breakthroughs on these long acting prep agents, you really need to navigate them quickly into ART, 
um, you can see that the, it's about a six and a half week delay in detection um, compared to the central laboratory at the site. When we first do genotyping on that first um, viral load when it's detected at the site, it's wild type. But by the time they're navigated into ART, which is three months later, they have that Q148R with a G140A. And that was because of a delay. This was a non-US site um, in getting the person able to be seen in locally available ART. Luckily, they didn't have transmitted non-nuke resistance and they were able to just press on a non-nuke-based regimen. I do wanna make sure we have time for questions. So I'm gonna zip quickly through the rest here. So these are sort of our take home points. Um, we did this extended testing, the viral loads were low. Um, there was a prolonged period of viral suppression. The antibody expression was diminished or delayed. And it was really complicated to make these diagnoses. I do wanna remind everyone that these findings were generalized to cisgender women in Sub-Saharan Africa in our sister study, HPTN084, arguably even more protective, 90% reduction in HIV incidence in the CAB versus the TDF FTC participants. We don't have the pharmacology and virology on these rare breakthroughs yet. Um, I believe this is gonna be presented or is hoping to be presented at an upcoming conference soon, but you know, it's a really impressive result that we hope is gonna to lead to regulatory approvals um, across populations. So you know, Ken loves this nomenclature, so I'm gonna stick with it. I like to think we're now in PrEP 3.0. And of course, you know, the twerking figures on the right side of your slide, um, getting the injections um, represent our cabotegravir understanding at this point. And of course, we've got additional um, long acting agents in the pipeline with oral aslatrovir monthly, injectable lenacapavir subcutaneously, maybe every six months, all in advanced phase clinical trials. And of course, our monoclonal antibody agenda, um, which although disappointing when a single agent BRCO1 was used, combinations of antibodies could be very exciting. Let me stop there because I want to make sure we have time for questions and discussion, but thanks for your attention and the invitation to share these exciting data with you. Wow, thank you so much for that, um, that talk. And, uh, and we do have some questions and I'm going to um, give a, we have a few minutes and a few questions. So um, hopefully, uh, we'll get to most of them. The first question was just about the adherence, um, that the adherence rates throughout the trial looked really impressive and wondering whether you have a sense of what real world adherence might look like. Yeah, thanks. It, it's a great question. And, you know, um, what we know from demonstration projects when you sort of take placebos out and you make it an open label sort of setting is um, exactly what you'd expect. You know, people who are good at taking tablets, who have lots of social supports, who are linked into healthcare and are well resourced, do great on it. And that's terrific. And I guess what I would say to that is if you're doing great on, on um, an oral prep preparation, good for you, keep doing that. Um, but what we see is, you know, our, our, our most vulnerable populations, our young populations, our black and brown populations, our trans populations, our people who are disenfranchised from healthcare um, in general are less well resourced, um, are, are struggling with daily oral adherence. And I suspect a lot of that has to do with stigma on top of it and provide lack of provider support and provider availability to provide support. Um, and this might, if we learn our lessons from TDF FTC prep rollout, be an incredible opportunity to take away some of those barriers about being seen with um, uh, uh, an agent that could be confused as being part of HIV treatment and requiring a daily uh, participant activity. We just don't know, but what we do see is very poor rates in those populations of PrEP persistence and adherence. So basically by six months to a year, people are dropping off and not coming in for refills. So I do think this is really an important opportunity, but we could bungle it very easily as well if we don't sort of remove the barriers um, to access. Yeah, thank you for that answer. And, and, and a lot of this just makes me, I have a whole list of questions and they're all about implementation, like how what you learned in the trial, and I think you did a great job of illustrating this, of raising these issues of what you saw in the, in the trial and what that should be helping us think about for um, implementation. Um, I'm going to skip around a bit here. Um, I, we might have time to get to all these, but I think this is a really good, important question in terms of how providers would communicate to um, to their patients who are taking PrEP. And so this is a hypothetical question. 
that says if I take oral prep and I, I take my oral prep tablet every day, I know that I have a high level of protection. So how would my personal confidence and protection change if I switch to long acting in that like two weeks, three weeks, right before the next injection in comparison to the oral tablets? And I think I would just add on to this question and say, you know, did you learn any, what, what if anything was learned from the trial that could be packaged into, into communication that would help help patients uh, who in need of prep make that best choice for themselves? Yeah, thanks. And I, I do think that that's the crux of understanding the results of this study. You know, I think the, the fact that it was a statistical superiority result is something that sort of gets repeated and amplified, but it does miss the nuance here. And I, I think to me, this is an effectiveness result. Cabotegravir covered sex acts better than did FTDF in this study. Um, I think we know, or you know, from, from these back calculations with FTDF, that it can be 99% protective against rectal exposure if taken as prescribed, and that's really powerful. Again, because this wasn't a placebo-controlled study, we're left to these sort of frustrating counterfactuals to try and estimate how effective cabotegravir is if taken as prescribed. And when I do back of the envelope calculations with this, I get somewhere in the 93, 94% protective range. So, you know, to me, it's a conversation with someone who's sitting in front of you. Look, it may be slightly less effective as a pure agent. And, you know, but if your preference is to take an injection, this is highly protective. It's not perfect. TDF, TDF isn't perfect either. It's, I think, as close to perfect as we've seen a PrEP agent to be um, at to date when taken as prescribed. But what we have seen repeatedly is it's very difficult to take exactly as prescribed. So if you're challenged by taking daily oral preparations or preparations of FTDF as prescribed, this could work better for you. And so it's, it is that balance. Is CAB perfect for PrEP? No. Um, and we still have a lot of work to do to understand the limits and the caveats around what might make it less protective. And I wish I could sort of lay all those plain today, but we're sort of at the beginning of that work. Yeah, but um, very, very helpful context. Um, and I'm just gonna ask one more that'll be quick, I think, um, which is just a detail about uh, the injection site reactions and how those levels were defined or distinguished, what the criteria were, if you, if you remember offhand. Yeah, great question. And sorry, it's a little bit um, wonky. Um, the Division of AIDS at NIH um, has defined what those categories are. They're generally mild, moderate, and severe, but there are some increased nuances of the, the actually measured size of the redness and the swelling at the injection site. And if it was discomfort, how um, impactful that discomfort was on people's usual activities. And we did have a handful of people who said, you know, I really couldn't sit down for a day or two. It was that uncomfortable. And it prevented me from, you know, going to dance class or doing my exercise or walking. Um, and, and I didn't like that. And so I don't want that anymore. And so it's not gonna be for everyone. Great, thank you so much. And I just wanna thank you again, um, for this presentation. And I mean, the science is exciting, but hearing the thought process and how the team thought this through, um, I could talk, I would have another discussion with you about the statistics and the, the um, how these cases were handled, but um, just really understanding this, the thought process is so valuable, I think, to all of our work. And I really um, think that we need to continue the discussion about what was learned beyond the uh, effectiveness results as you sort of characterize them um, to think about uh, how this translates to implementation and what we need to be thinking about next. But I wanna thank everyone for attending. Thank my, um, my co-lead Ken uh, uh, Mayer for um, sort of uh, getting us rolling today and um, for the, uh, to the Harvard CIFAR for the organization of this webinar. And um, thanks to all of you for attending. And we will be in touch uh, with the schedule for the next session. Thanks again, um, Dr. Lindovitz. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.